some reason I felt like I should start speaking Swedish now because I'm uh, so much spending so much time in Sweden uh, these days. It was sort of nice when I could see you a little bit better. I guess that's what happened. Do you want me to put the other light on? Yeah, yeah. a little bit. Okay. Like, hold it. You want that light on? And I'll turn that off? I mean, yeah. It's up to you. Could you record that well? Um, is that right? That's fine. If you, if you could see the screen, it's possible. Yeah, so why don't we do, the, if, if someone is close to the thingy, then uh, maybe when I'm, when I'm showing some okay. movies, we can just dim it down. Okay. Fantastic, Carol. Lovely. Thank you guys for coming. Um, it's a pleasure to be here in my own uh, stomping grounds. I, um, I love typography and uh, I wish I had more time to spend on it. That's my name. And uh, uh, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about how I got to where I am now. Um, I have to start with uh, some of my early and not very good design and some people who uh, <coughs> have been around for a long time may notice uh, <coughs> the hit parade there in the bottom. I think that was a very nice old uh <coughs> Apple typeface that uh, I think it was called San Francisco. Now there's another typeface called San Francisco. So anyway. Um, I had a record store, I was a DJ, I had a club, and I started to make flyers, and uh, as I made these flyers, this is made on some, it's probably made on a PC. In the same time, I got a Mac, and I started to play around a little bit, and uh, this is the first poster that I ever made, and here I was clearly into type um, in a big way, and there were some things that I didn't know, like, uh, what you shouldn't do with lowercase letters and stuff like that. But but uh, this poster was very, um, it wasn't that very big, it was about, you know, a, a little, like, three feet maybe square. And it got very popular, so, so whenever we put them up, people tore them down. Actually, we don't know, if maybe they didn't like them at all, <laughs> just one of them. But, but uh, we heard some rumors that some people had them, took them home. And so uh, I worked with this, uh, it was for a dance company, and I, I worked with them for a few years. And somewhere in this process, I decided that I would be a designer. And this uh, will be hard for almost everyone in this room to understand that there was a time when you couldn't just go on the internet and look up design. So what do you do if you just want to be a designer and <clears throat> you're in a, in a pre-internet era? You go to some bookstore, no, some newsstands and you buy a really, really ex expensive print magazine because the dollar was very high compared to the Swedish krona. And besides, I didn't have any money. Um, so, um, and then uh, you go to used bookstores. And that's where I found a book of John Chickholz. And um, he kind of taught me everything about typography. And I'm not even sure that I read the book, but I copied it. I'd like everything that he had done, I just, like, on my Mac that I had, some uh, Macintosh old pewter colored things. Now, pewter, no, what is it called? The, that yellowish plastic? Um, so I just copied, and for me there was just, that's what you do, because that's how I learned to play the guitar. That's, that I just copy what other people are doing. And uh, after a while I started to, when I had to apply it to my actual situations, then it was sort of a bridge to try to make it work with different lengths of type and different things, and then you had to start to, to feel how the composition looked. Anyway, I decided I would be a designer, and uh, there was uh, airmail had the, those little stickers that said Paravion, and I thought that that sounded so cool, so I decided that my design studio would be called Paravion. And uh, this was 
the very business card, I think, that got me to America. Because I got, was interested in type and came to, uh, I was first at, at a, a type conference in Oxford uh, in 1990. And then I was at a monotype type conference in New York in 91. And Carol knows all of them. Both of them, right? Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I didn't know I didn't know uh, Americans. So when when all the Americans I met said, "Cool, you should come here, and everything is going to be fine," I, I didn't understand that that's how you talk in America. Uh, I thought that oh, they must have seen something special <laughs> in that business card. <laughs> so uh, so. Um, Anyway, so I sold 10,000 vinyls and uh, moved to New York. And uh, one part of the whole thing was that I wanted to do something that was very, very hard. I felt like everything I had done so far in my life had just happened. Like, you know, and it's, it's, it can be a blessing when things go your way, sort of. But after a while, you're like, I thought that you were supposed to struggle in life a little bit. It would, it would suffer because I, you know, I didn't go to college. I after high school, I was I was tired of school. I was just building electronics and playing vinyl and being a DJ. And um, then I got a job at a restaurant, and it happened to be a record store next to. And then I got a job there, and then there were, then I became a DJ because someone asked me to do that and then we started a club and then I did a little design and like it had never been a sense of, of real effort I felt so uh, moving to New York that was going to be the big sort of iron bath for me where I was going to be starving and walking around on the streets and not like having any friends <laughs> and, you know suffering but um, it actually didn't work out that way because um, someone uh, asked me to give the people that are actually Tom Geismar of Shemayev Geismar said uh, you should go and talk to the people at our Greenberg Associates um, and I said who are they and he said they do animation and I was I was thinking about Walt Disney, like then, like Mickey Mouse or something. I'm saying, no, 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 that's not what I want to do. I want to do typography. Um, so I didn't go there. And then the second person said, said, you should, uh, you should talk to them. And um, so I did. Uh, this second person said, you should call someone whose name is Kyle Cooper, and and maybe uh, you should meet with him. And I met with him, and I got a job. And uh, I think I got a job mostly because all the design that I showed was done on the computer, and they had no idea how to do that. Um, and it's interesting because it's actually the very reason why I didn't get a job in Sweden, because they said, how did you do this? And I said, on a computer. And they said, no, nah, we don't use computers. <laughs> so uh, anyway. So that happened, and now I know that uh, the sort of the theme of what I'm going to talk about is a little bit. Well, it's actually not about anything that has to do with motion. So, but since I'm at the Type Directors Club and I started sort of a, a journey, I thought I'd show you some of the early work that I did. That was sort of my own little history of of typography in motion. And it started just when I had been there uh, for a few months, and um, Kyle and I was working on the first ever animated opening to the TED conference, which was TED 3. And if everything works, this should be it. And we really just cut up the letters, like cut them apart and, and I think we photographed them and then put them into something. Mm -hmm. And then we did, it had something else at the end that wasn't that nice. But, but that was just the first kind of thing, how can you just strip letters apart and stuff. Then for TED4, um, okay, I'll show it. Actually, I wasn't going to show it, but I will. Um, Thank <laughs> you. 
Just because someone was talking earlier today on, do you remember when you worked in Macro Mind Director or something? And this, and and I actually animated this in Macro Mind Director, and and uh, I was gonna say don't ask me how, but I I uh, this part I didn't do because you couldn't, you didn't have a camera that didn't exist. You just had a flat plane, but everything else I did with with uh, I masked all the lines with with like hundreds. Of little black dots that I just like animated off like cell by cell and that was that. anyway so uh, then the, it kind of set up the I was only I started to get really interested in, in animation obviously because I was working at a place where we did film titles and stuff so um, and um, and I wanted to experiment how type could work with it so after TED4, I wanted to do more something that was more type centric, and this is just a short little piece of TED5, where I was just fascinated by all of these patterns that that uh, happened, and also red was a really bad color for all the medium back then because it, it all it sort of yeah it didn't work that well. But um, it was a nice idea. Bob Greenberg ruined this uh, opening for me because he insisted that I do a pullback or some reveal, and it really wasn't good. That's why I'm only showing a little piece of it. Um, <laughs> not even geniuses are right all the time. Um, so where are we? Ted five, Ted six. Now I had gotten into my head that I wanted to. I wanted to be an architect before I became a designer. So when I had to be a designer, I was like, well, can I be a little bit of an architect at the same time? So I wanted to work with type in 3D. But the thing is that when you work with type in 3D, back then people were just thinking about like extruded golden letters and, and really tacky stuff. So I said, okay, no, I'm just gonna work with 2D type, but in 3D. So this is a little piece of that. And I built up sort of a whole world, and I needed to have some some elements in it. So I decided that all the speakers they could be part of this opening. And then it's a. And I I would like to have a like an HD copy of that somewhere, but I don't. Okay, I'm going to rush through <laughs> these last. TED things, but uh, when I was going to do TED 7, I wanted to, I had decided I wanted to extrude letters, and I wanted to spin them around their own axis, so that a T looked like a nail, a Y looked like a martini glass, right? So you just rotate them around their axis like that. So I got all of these type in um, to soft image, big bulky software and um, I set it all up and then I hit the button that said like revolve and it didn't revolve the way I thought it's the type started to form big orbits and I was like this is the most beautiful thing I've seen type doing it's not at all what I wanted and then I was like what can I do with this and I was like I can make an eight with it but I was working on Ted 7 <laughs> So I was like, oh. and to take one of your like coolest design that you come up with and park it for a year is very hard. Mm -hmm. But I did, and and instead I was because uh, computers and resolution, and I think we had a little bit of internet also in '97. Uh, it was really shitty, uh, and everything was pixelated. So I was trying to find art in artifacts so I was thinking about how can these because the ugliest thing ever back then in a way I felt was a pixelated image and um, I was forcing myself to see if there could be some beauty in this thing so out of those thought patterns came uh, Ted 7 placeholder for the for the year
it's good because there was a lot of man, men who were speaking at the conference who felt self-important because men do, and and they were very happy when I could feature the names in all of these animations. That was uh, um, why they were happy about that. That was a little excerpt from that. Um, so Ted eight then, uh, which was kind of it's, it's funny because I felt that that I. I've never had like my moment of seven or something that like I've had, or where I became a rock star. But but uh, Ted Eight was the closest to fame I think I ever was because that was really people like that. Yeah, that shit is hot, uh, <laughs> and also really bad resolution. <laughs> Still a, a pretty nice piece. So um, since we, again, since we're at the Type Drives Club, and very few people have seen these openings, everyone can see the TED Talks, but the, the <coughs> opening uh, titles aren't that easy to find. Um, I did a, an insane opening for for TED New York City, which was a really bad conference. It didn't work at all. But but. Um, so this conference I did in 69 hours, this opening I did, did in 69 hours, and I know it because I was awake for all of those hours. <laughs> so this is 69 hours of nonstop uh, work. And it was so, uh, it was so abstract, uh, it was so weird, because when, directly when I was done with the uh, animation, which you're gonna see is all New York City, um, I, in type, uh, I went to the music house to 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 work work with the music, and then in a break we went to the the roof terrace, and there was New York City, and and to me that was the most mind blowing thing that all of these wireframes that I've been sitting and working and plugging into my my head for for 69 hours straight, they actually existed out there. Um, the whole internet revolution because I didn't want to work with it. When I left RGA, it had all been about digital. And um, and then you had, you had like dial-up modems, and they were 14K or something, which is about one millionth of the speed you have today. And I couldn't do anything online. I could just put up pictures, and I wanted to do motion. So um, I started a troll-working company. I also wanted to go back to my Scandinavian roots because as you maybe saw on the first design things, there was sort of a little bit romantic American art deco, that whole thing that I loved. Um, and uh, when I started my own company, I was thinking, okay, I'm gonna be European Scandinavian. I'm, I'm not gonna uh, do all this stuff. So uh, I started to talk to my designers all the time, like, well, why do you put that in there? And, and is there a reason for that to be there? And the reason can be that it's beautiful. It's not like some kind of, of uh, uh, other thing. Um, so we did a little work, uh, and then just uh, uh, we, we started to do some TV networks, and 
we did some film titles um, things and then 9-11 happened and I can't figure out how I'm going to shoot this because it's impossible but this is our 9-11 t-shirt and these the the two missing pieces of the end uh, they're fluorescent uh, just windows so if you in the light and then you go into a dark room it, it sort of lights up the whole thing um, and a lot of people have done a lot of things with 9-11 and I didn't see this one for anyone. Anyway, it says that I'm running out of battery here. I'm going to take care of it. There you go. Okay. So I lied. I'm going to show some more TED pieces. <laughs> One more of it. Because it's, it's, uh, since the TED 8 had been so successful, I was asked to do one for Ted's 30th anniversary. And then I was thinking, okay, I'm going to do sort of an homage to myself and, and do another type animation, crazy type animation. So, Carol. Okay, so the almost cartoonish TED 2009 at the end was uh, because the guy who runs TED, he's like, I want it big, and I want a big boom. So, so we gave him that. that. Um, I have two more pieces until I'm going to get to the topic matter. It's, it's like I don't want to talk about it, but, but um, these are two other animations that are type related. And uh, the first one is very, very little type related because it has a very tiny type on it. But uh, we've been working with wor World, uh, um, it's called Science Festival, uh, for many years. And um, I was wondering how an animation would look that, that technology created. So we had uh, one of our software engineers starting to write formula that outputted different mathematical formulas in, in the shape of patterns. And then um, we put in different variables and we just set, set it rendering over the nights. And we looked at sort of all the weird things that came out of it. And finally there was like a, a grain of something. Talk about evolution, right? So there was a grain of, of something. Oh, this, is, this looks really cool. Can we tweak the parameter, parameters to get more of that? So, um, this is completely made by software and there's a type overlay and that's the code that's actually generating it. Obviously, we picked the very pieces of software that created something beautiful, but still, that's the deal.
nothing like a good track, right? <laughs> Uh, that music is from uh, uh, Michael Montes, who's done basically the music for all of our uh, extraordinary pieces. Some like that we do for no money for weird people. Okay, I'm going to skip this here, and I'm going to get to the tonight's topic. Actually, Carol, you don't. Uh, uh, we're good for now, for a bit. All right. So I'm going to talk about how you communicate to seven billion people, I think. And um, I'm going to tell you how that started. We've been doing a lot of TV networks, and um, you kind of check them off. And then you wonder, what, what else are we going to do that's really exciting? And we have been looking at BBC for a long time. And when they came to us and wanted us to create new networks. It was uh, a fantastic opportunity. Here's some, um, we decided that one of the channels should be called BBC Drama, which is what they were doing, their original drama. And we did this, uh, this idea that there were two sides to a lot of things. And um, uh, so we did a, a series of posters, and I don't remember exactly, but this is, I mean, genius and lunatic, that's probably Luther or something, right? So we took the, the great uh, TV shows and, and made these posters. That never, like, that was our pitch, that got us a job. And, and, um, but there were three networks, and it was one uh, drama network, there was one guys network, because they had this, um, it's so funny, I forget the name of it, but the three guys that do this crazy thing with cars, and one of them is, is a total asshole, you know now. Um, what's the name of the show? Top Gear. Top Gear. <laughs> Top Gear was so familiar, so fit, so, it did so great, so they wanted to do a whole channel with just Top Gear kind of stuff. And then, uh, uh, like a natural science channel. So, this is the work we did for that. That was a, that job was just so much fun. And Amanda Hill, who is now at at uh, working with A and E, was heading that that whole thing. And through Amanda, I became friends with Tim Davy, who was the, the CEO of BBC Worldwide. And uh, that's really where where this story starts. Um, not that the names. I mean, they're great people, but. Um, so what happened after I had met T Tim Davy was that uh, September the 26th, uh, there was uh, this guy from BBC who came and wanted to visit me, and his name was Richard Curtis. And I was like, well, okay, there's some Richard and some Amanda, and they're coming from something called Comic Relief at BBC. And um, do you guys know who Richard Curtis is? Because we're sitting there in the conference room, and he says, "Oh, uh, I got your name from Tim Davy. He said that you know you're doing really good brand work, and and um, 
I should see you if I'm in New York. Do you know who I am? And I was like, mm, no. <laughs> and then he said that he did some of these things, like all of them. And I was like, oh, yeah, I think, <laughs> I think I know that. So he came to talk about uh, the fact that they wanted to launch Red Nose Day in America. And uh, they needed some help with the packaging and stuff. And that sounded great. And then he said, uh, when we were done with that, he said, and then there's one more thing. I have this little project that I've been thinking about. And then he basically did this thing. Hello, this is Richard Curtis here, um, maker of uh, TV shows and films, some fair, some poor, but I want to talk to you about something really wonderful, which myself and a lot of people and organizations are doing in the course of this year which would be so fantastic if you could um, help us with, and it's called Project Everyone. So here's the thing we're focusing on. In the year 2000, uh, the UN issued uh, this group of goals called the Millennium Development Goals, which were a kind of plan to really deal with some of the worst things, to deal with hunger, poverty, kids not in education, water, sanitation, peace, all these things. and. They have in fact been remarkably effective and part of a remarkable 15 years where despite all the negative things that we hear, in fact child mortality has dropped from 12 million to 6 million annually. I've heard Bill Gates say that this has been the greatest 15 years in the battle against poverty in the history of humanity. Um, and we've seen diseases like malaria and polio and the really, really going downwards and um, AIDS not completely but extraordinarily brought um, within the possibility of being under control. So um, what's happening is that in 2015, this year, the UN are issuing some new goals, the Sustainable Development Goals, and we think of them as a sort of plan for the planet, a to-do list for the planet, a series of actions which if taken could achieve these two amazing goals, which is to bring to the end extreme poverty and also to really get to grips with the issue of climate change. And the thing that we're trying to do is get these goals out there because famous goals will be more effective goals. Famous goals will be things that leaders try and fulfill and that citizens can fight for. And so we believe that if we can make everyone know the goals, there's much more chance of the goals succeeding and we can be a generation that achieves extraordinary things. So Project Everyone's plan is, as it were, to get seven billion people to know about these goals in seven days and for them to be the foundation of an extraordinary time of progress. And what we're asking you is to be partners in this epic quest to achieve these epic things and see whether or not together we could work to get the goals to everyone on the planet to try and make the planet so much more perfect by 2030. So that was sort of his pitch and um I said, he said, are you interested in doing this uh, uh, little job of making the, you can turn on the light. I, I, I actually don't think I have any more videos. Um, so uh, I said, yes, I want to do this. And uh, then I was sitting on my ass for a couple of, of months just waiting for the UN to create this document. And um, in December 2014, I get this email. It says, from Richard, very good. Maybe we can have a name and a logo, the goal of the goals, and emotional clustering, and the goals themselves, and desired outcomes. And in this email was a PDF, and it was very exciting. Um, the Road to Dignity by 2030, Ending Poverty, Transforming All Lives, and, and Protecting the Planet. So. Uh, that's how this project started, and the idea is everybody wants a be better world, and now we have a plan. Uh, 193 countries have agreed on 169 targets, 17 goals, one plan. So it's called the Sustainable Development Goals, and uh, it's a complete agenda for a better world. I know you guys can't read, so I'm just like, this should be a little ball jumping down there. Um, so this 
was now like in my inbox, so I was very excited about it because who wouldn't be? And I'm opening it, and, and I have instructions. The whole agenda is on page 18, and that's page 18. So um, that's how you fix the planet, and it seemed a little bit like you know, how can I make anyone excited about this at all? So um, that's where I started to think about it. And the first thing that happened was that I, I knew the designer I wanted to work with, uh, Christina Ruik, who has worked with me for a very long time, but has now moved back to Switzerland to have a family and children and be happy. But uh, we're still working together, and I knew that she would be perfect for this project. So uh, I started to think about how I could, could, could get this into some kind of shape, and I put down some rules for how we could work with this. And the rules were information is not communication, complexity is confusing, and simplicity is beautiful. I was like, that's, we should apply that to everything. And then I was also thinking about, from a philosophical standpoint, if you're going to take on a, a big Pro, a big project about change, you really need to look to the outcome, you need to look forward. And that's something that we all do all the time, right? You don't get out of bed in the morning and go to work, go to the subway or whatever, without knowing that, yeah, I'm going to achieve the goal of getting to work this or school or whatever it is, right? So we always set these goals and, and then we're just working to go there. And so uh, I was saying every big and challenging journey must be driven by the image of su success. So we really had to, not talking about the, these 15 years, we have to talk about 2030 and how that's going to be a better world. Um, so back to, uh, back to Christina then, how could I get her to work on this crazy document and I realized I had to do some copywriting and I said I have to just focus this because and poverty in all its forms everywhere that's the first goal that's fine but no poverty looks a lot better it looks very pink from me. it's red <laughs> and I went through all of the goals uh, and hunger, achieve food security, and improve nutrition, and promote sustainable agriculture. That became just no hunger. So they all, I tried to make them so smart as possible. Ensure inclusive and equitable quality education, and promote lifelong learning opportunities for all. That is just quality education. So, and I did these just because I wanted to give my designers of marching orders, do something with poverty, do something with this and that, and uh, you know, make cities and human settlements inclusive, safe, resilient, and sustainable. You really have to think a lot, but sustainable cities and communities is much easier. And then you have things like conserve and sustainably use the ocean, seas, and marine resources for sustainable development. That became just life below water. So they were all about making something that felt very crisp, very easy to grasp. And then Christina started to work. And this was uh, one of the very first designs. Well, I think the first one was just like two icons or whatever. We, we had a discussion about what kind of design it would be. Um, the, I think one thing that has driven like the whole thing a lot is that we're using Giorgio Sans in everything. And that has, it, it, that was really a stroke of brilliance, I think, it wasn't me. Uh, so, uh, because it's a really bold typeface, it's not used widely. It's something that, that uh, so we've gotten, um, quite some, some it's, it's an ownable way to work with it. And, 
and um, in addition, we've got, you know, the foundry have been very nice, so everyone who's doing this work gets a 50% discount on it. Anyway, we had six different colors because there wasn't a, like a really stupid idea from the UN that we should focus them into six groups of goals <coughs> because people thought that 17 goals were too much. So um, that's basically it. We learned a lot of things. Like we thought that no hunger, it was good to have an X there, but it turns out that people don't use fork in the forks in the world. So uh, in the next iteration, that was a bowl of soup. And then when it comes to like all of these icons went through all of the kind of discussions, quality education. Well, it's not really about graduating. It's just about learning, and then can it be a blackboard, a whiteboard, or an iPad, or, you know, so we worked with, with a lot of different ways to try to figure stuff out. And meanwhile, all of the titles were changing all the time, because the, 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 I was in constant meetings at the UN to discuss what they could be called, and all of these goals have really powerful people behind them who says, no, you cannot do that, and you have to do this. And um, you see that goal 13 is called Protect the Planet, which I really loved, because I felt that, that talking about the climate was something that, anyway, in America, there's... I, I wanted the, the names to be able to build consensus. Like, everyone can agree on that, so that, that there wouldn't be like, well, I, I'm not sure about that. And I was just feeling protect the planet. That was uh, that was a done deal. So um, I kept it for a while. Now something happened here, which was that we realized that I'm going back. That if you only have six colors, the groupings are going to be weird, because I'm telling everyone that that I work with that whenever you're designing things, if you, if you're a designer, if you're an artist then you want to make people think. Then you want to throw something out and say, hey, what do you think of this? I feel something and I'm going to you know, expose you to my feelings in some way. When you're, in where, when you're a designer, you're sort of so much more of a control freak because you're like, this is what I want you to feel. This is what I want you to take away. This is, you know, you're, you have a purpose. That's my, you know, definition of it. Um, so uh, the groupings, if you start asking questions, why is, okay, quality education, innovation in infrastructure, and then justice, that's kind of a weird thing. So somewhere here, I was happy with the palette, but I, somewhere I realized we're gonna need 17 colors, which is really goddamn hard to find 17 colors who look good together and feel different. So uh, we started to work with that. Oh, this, is, this might be very close to the final one, despite the fact that um, they probably look completely different in this projection. But, but, you know, we learned a lot of things. I was, I'm going to sound stupid now, but, you know, I was making gender equality pink because I think, I think pink is a really hot color. And I think that, yeah, own it. It's awesome. Um, but man, the backlash. It's like, you can absolutely not do it. That's a girlish color. And I was like, no, it's a really cool color. Anyway, so um, <coughs> reduced inequalities that had to change names to, no. Reduced inequalities, I'm sorry, I'm just being stupid here now. Reduced inequalities was global pros prosperity before. It's like all of these things have changed names. Anyway, so here was this, the final set of, of icons, and each of them have about an hour of a story, except for Life Below Water, which was there from the very beginning, and everybody loved. And I was like, yeah, that's done. Um, and I've already, you know, uh, another one I, I would like to point out is goal six, uh, because um, 
clean water and sanitation. In an earlier iteration, it was even just only called clean water, and then you learn, and you realize that, that sanitation is much more important than clean water. It's the most important uh, thing to fix, actually, when it comes to to uh, large areas of Africa. Um, but we had this beautiful icon of a glass with like fresh water, and. Um, I mean, a Mohammed at the UN, who was head of this project, said, "Well, Jacob, you're just going to have to get a toilet in there. Live with it." And I was like, "I can't," because the idea was also that all of these icons should be, you should, they should be beautiful in some way. So that's when someone was on a train in uh, in England and took a, a snapshot of a toilet sign that had like a water swirling and an arrow on it. And I was like, my God, we're just going to put an arrow on that thing. And then there we have the water going in, and it can also go out. And people were surprisingly like, yeah, I guess that's sanitation. Um, we had just finished these icons when someone said, oh, but wait a minute. I just got a call from a, a, from a paper, and they want to print them, but they only print in black and white. And we hadn't, we hadn't been thinking about it at all. So I just opened the computer and selected them all in the Illustrator and I was like, okay, let's select black. And um, that, that, they almost look better in black and white. Everything looks better in black and white. That's just amazing. Um, when that was done, we wanted to name these because uh, sustainable development goals are big, internally called the SDGs, and that sounds like something that you don't want to have. <laughs> and um, so we said, let's just call them the Global Goals for Sustainable Development. And uh, I can, about, about half the world is using Global Goals. The rest of the world who is listening to Jeffrey Sachs at the UN, they insist that they should be called the Sustainable Development Goals. And, and we've had so many uh, conversations about this because um, I'm saying you, you're going to reach people. You got to find that name that's a little bit better than that. Then we needed a logo type. It started with a lot of people. I'm very happy that that's not the logo type. <laughs> um, it was 17 goals, so started to look at it, I, I don't think that's 17, that's probably 16. Um, and then it seemed like maybe it should be a sun, something. And maybe it should be 17 pieces, so that's part of it. And then uh, we realized that if you took the center out of it, it was even more interesting. And now there's 17 pieces all of a sudden, and then you just uh, apply the 17 colors, and then you have the logotype for the global goals. And this actually, what, having a logotype solved something that, because I have total OCD, it's like, you know, I, not in a stupid way, my closet is still messy, but like I arrange things. And um, this, I mean, what do you do? I had been like, this got to be a 17 pattern. Um, but all of a sudden, we had that thing. And then it was, everything was just good. Um, well, after that, um, I felt that if we're going to get people rallied behind this whole thing, we need some kind of a manifesto. So. Um, I wanted to write something, and I started to write, started with the first goal, and then see if I could get a sentence that goes over to the second goal, and etc. So um, we have now, imagine a world where there's no poverty and zero hunger. We have good health and well-being, quality education, and full gender equality everywhere. There's clean water and sanitation for everyone. Affordable and clean energy has helped to create decent work 
and economic growth. Our prosperity is fueled by investments in industry, innovation, and infrastructure, and that has helped us to reduce inequalities. We live in sustainable cities and communities, and responsible consumption and production is healing our world. Climate action has capped the warming of the planet, and we have flourishing life below water and abundant, diverse life on land. We enjoy peace and justice through strong institutions and we have built long-term partnerships for the goals. Welcome to the world of the Global Goals 2030. Those colors are really interesting. <laughs> but what's more interesting is that you can do this. And that's the 17 goals and they're in goddamn order, <laughs> which, was, which was the most fun part for me. And so this is sort of a study on how you can go from that to building a complete communication system. So what's next is that all of these goals have a lot of targets under them. So we've started to work on them because this is how the targets look. And that's also not helpful to people. So we've started to do copywriting. So goal 14 now looks like this. Marine pollution, ecosystems, acidification, sustainable fishing, conserved coastal and marine areas, no subsidies for overfishing, which is a huge thing, and sustainable use of marine resources. So we're going through each of these 17 goals and making them understandable. And then, of course, because we're designers, then we can't help but continue to make icons. So, reduce marine pollution, protected, restored ecosystem, and sustainable fishing. This is all work in progress. Um, and then we're studying how all of these targets have a cross impact, because if you have a goal and then all of the targets around them, all of the goals are interacting with each other. And the best example of that, I think, is um, in Ethiopia, they, uh, they built, they had a school and they said, we really should build toilets here. We should have water and sanitation. This is many years ago. And the result was just spectacular because it turns out that all of the girls stayed in school they didn't have this at home, right? And this was, this was a, a dream for them, to be able to keep themselves clean, and when they had the period, there wasn't a problem, there was like, and the result was that they never wanted to leave school. So they were in school all the time. They stayed in school, they got education, they didn't marry off earlier, and they started, to, they started businesses. And so if you're talking about goal five, gender equality, in certain areas, the best way to deal with that might be with goal six, which is clean water and sanitation. There's obviously so many things that are oppressing women everywhere, so, but it, it can be a very good first part of it. So to fully understand these uh, things, we, we're now working with some uh, researchers in, in Stockholm, and what we want to do is something like this, create a planet where you have uh, all of the goals, you can go in and, and you can see which goals are uh, relative to different areas and you can sort of pull in one and see what happens with the other ones. And then there's indicators for everything, so we get feedback from, from what we're doing. So this is female representation in global government, it's fine, yeah. It's this, but this is how we're used to look at these statistics. So we said, why don't we do something that people can understand a little bit easier and see that, okay, we're here and it's pretty lame and we need to go there. So we've done a set of posters about gender equality. We've done about 20 of these, gender equality. This is about carbon. That's about clean um, energy. This is about the Zika and AIDS, malaria. This is internet access. 
This is girls in education. We're focusing a lot on, on girls and women because it's the most, it's, it's the best thing we could ever do in the world today. Um, climate warming, of course, but uh, overfishing, <coughs> uh, maternal health, and uh, also women, girls being threatened. So we, we, we want to create sort of a nuclear language for this, where, where, where we have icons, symbols for everything that we can measure. So protected marine areas, fish stock, depleted fish stocks, carbon per capita, corruption, change in forest areas. This is some just from yesterday actually about pollution and ratio of of um, of sustainable for sustainable fish stocks and acidification. So this is our little lab. We're working with that. It's a lot of fun, and uh, it has spread quite well. The flags are just I just love them, especially the one uh, at the bottom of the ocean there. Uh, some concert, the UN building, Liverpool played with Goldbergs T-shirts. Um, Emma Watson is, as many of you know, very involved in this. Oh yes, there's a chess thing. My dad was a big chess player, so he would have been happy. Um, and then we've done a couple of pavilions and things. This was at the World Economic Forum, where we introduced our white logo type on the grad, which we love so much. And, and now we were thinking we would make global gold scarves with all of the, the colors. Um, a lot of companies are using the goals on the websites, Volvo, Ericsson, and Tetra Pak. These are all Swedish companies. And um, water bottles, the UN are terrible with water bottles. They have like so much plastic. So, um, yeah, it's really sad and ironic. And then juice boxes in, this is an educational campaign they did in, in Denmark. Um, we're pushing H&M to make t-shirts because it would be so incredibly cool. And um, for the young kids, we were thinking about sustainable building blocks also, which would be, <laughs> which would be fun. And then there's Leo. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm just have I've gone over my time already. Yeah. Um, when we launched the goals, we had a big uh, we projected all of the goals on the UN building, which was pretty cool. So, um, 
finally, I would say, uh, this is sort of what we've condensed this to. Information is not communication. And I think that's like, everyone should think about that all the time. And uh, because if you want to communicate, you need to connect with people and you need to create. And for us, that's always sort of an emotional connection uh, because you need to understand where people come from. You need, I mean, as weird as this may sound, you need to understand the people who voted for Trump. You need to like figure out what's driving them because they're not, you know, they're not, yeah, some may not be that educated, but they're not stupid people. <laughs> no, but uh, actually, this is not, but, but um, someone said after the, the election that you win by having a good story. And this time, a douchebag had the best story. And it's true. Anyway, and the influence. If you don't understand, you don't care. If you don't care, you want to act because all action is emotional. So that's sort of the arc, how you connect with people, I think. And um, beauty and logic. And of course, I want the aliens to be proud of us. <laughs> this is a quote that actually, I heard him say this at a presentation, but it's nowhere online. I was like, did I really make that up? So I googled it and it was a reference to me mentioning it, but I have it in my notes from that, from that meeting. Uh, he said that. I don't know. Uh, I think I, if you have any questions or anything, I, I was, I was going to talk about the Olympics also, but I, 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 should I just say something about the Olympics? Yes. 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 I don't know when we get thrown out. From the <laughs> it's up to Carol. Carol, you have you have a long commute, don't you? Yes, but I'm fine. Okay. She'll tell you. She'll start taking the train and grabbing you. I wanted you here, so I have to play. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I'm just opening the file now. I, is, is any of this online so I can share this? Uh, the uh, uh, I love the progression of your branding. Is it is it possible to see your symbols online? Yeah, there's several places where they are. I think the best place where, I mean, you can find it if you go to the UN or or whatever. I think that the best place where we where you where we're gonna put them, they're not up yet, but they, that is gonna be. Um, the new division, which is the new Stockholm company that's going to do all of the Trollbeck's sustainability, equality, and justice work. Um, and our URL is pretty cool because it's the new division dot world. Because we were like, yeah, dot com or dot org or something, but they were all taken. But that world, and I was like, that's even better. Um, we also will have this as a video last Oh, thank you. And you can just live through how, how I was blabbering. So, uh, you know, it's funny because um, once you start to work with with a project like the Global Goals, and now we're working on a lot of, of projects that are connected to that. Um, a lot of, of other work is like, okay, what I'm going to say about this. Uh, we were very uh, happy that NBC, I mean, it's this weird thing that NBC always have their own Olympics logo type. And now that we've done the last two, we think it's great, of course, because we think ours is better than theirs, like the official one. But it shouldn't really be that way. That's just a stupid marketing thing, but um, the the idea that that obviously when you spend all this this money to buy the Olympics, you want to brand yourself with them in some way. I think that that's that's a good idea. Um, so we were uh, 
do, we wanted to do a custom typeface, we knew that for sure, and we wanted to do an enclosing shape, and, and the, the logotypes that the MBC has been done before has been a lot of stuff that's just stacked on top of each other. So we wanted to do a piece that could contain everything. So, you know, this is how you sell it, the sun, the ocean, and, and uh, sunrise and sunset. That's, that's sort of the, the thing. And then I think that what we did, was, which was really, really cool, um, let's see if I, can, if I can bring that up was that we did, an, um, we did an app. We did this app that's called Video Dynamics, and now, of course, I have to switch the Just all of the parameters, uh, so you can change the animation of the colors. You can change the shape of them. Uh, you can change. Um, let's see. So we played a lot with with the expression of it, with the intensity, the speed, and everything. And we wanted it to have to live online in different shapes and different forms. And of course, it became a, like a huge project. But this is what you can do when you have a programmer who's working with you. And, and uh, I lost my cursor. It's probably on the other screen. Can I clean? Yeah. Move the shape of it. And you can change the velocity of the lighting. On the can you guys see this? This is just weird. Yeah. So we work with the different palettes, and it's a really interesting way to work with design. You know, we have a live object that you can move around and, uh, and such. There. Uh, I'm going to switch back to this thing, and then I don't know if there's anything more here. Or it's just. I'm, I'm going to be completely honest and saying that I wasn't the lead on this project. I'm very happy w with it, and I think it looks great. I could have brought someone else here to talk about this, but we didn't have time. So, do you guys want to ask anything? Uh, is there anything that... I know a lot of things I've said doesn't make sense, but that's probably the way it is. Yes. When you're dealing with these social issues where people are really, really, really invested in them in one way or another, like you're saying, can't use pink for that. Do you have any thoughts about how you navigate that stuff in order to get what you think is right or hear what they think is right in order to translate that into some good result? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think the hardest thing that I did <coughs> From a from a like from a base standpoint, and then it was really easy when I figured it out was that I told myself I have to I have to understand a pro life person, and especially being Sweden Swedish and being very liberal liberal, because I I just I was like it doesn't make sense that all of these people are just like idiots, and. And uh, um, and I realized that if, if you look at it in a particular way, 
life is the most precious thing that there is and when the life has been created that's something that's very precious and and you know of course the answer to, there there are two quotes what, what it, when it comes to abortion I know I'm circling around your question but the two answers two things about abortions and one is the car, car sticker that I saw if you're against abortions don't have one and the other one is we don't have too many abortions we have too many unwanted pregnancies so you need to deal with the problem but to understand people and understand where, where they're coming from and then understand someone that may be in the absolute opposite camp they just have another way to look at it so when you're talking to someone who has a reaction to pink or to whatever it is you need to get into their world view and it's very hard but if we can't do that it's not good enough to be on the right side because we're deciding that we're on the right side I'm deciding that I'm on the right side but the truth about that and now I'm just completely floating away here but the truth of, uh, about that is that people who are wrong don't know that they're wrong because and when when I'm wrong it feels great because I think I'm right it doesn't matter so there's nothing that says to a person you're wrong Every, everyone that we think are wrong totally believe that they're right and sometimes they are because that's when we're wrong but you need to have that openness when you're dealing with communication to um, to understand them and then there are people who are just wrong because they're assholes then the people who are like yeah I'm better than everyone else and women are shit and, and like you know those people are just idiots but they probably had an idiot parents or an idiot father at least that made them that way god where is this going <laughs> <laughs> so I would say vote for me in the next um, yeah someone else had a question yes yeah I was curious because you spent a lot of time talking about the development goals and talk about setting a new kind of agency or brand for that sort of work and then kind of transitioned into the commercial work and doing both sides. I'm curious, you know, why set a separate brand and kind of your thoughts behind doing that sort of work? Is it because it's more fulfilling to you or is it because you have a lot of that work and it requires some separate team? Like just your thoughts behind yeah. doing that work versus the commercial work. I think, the, you know, Trollbeck and Company is doing very well. Uh, it's, you know, we're about 30 people and really busy. And I think uh, I just became a pain to all of those people there because I always came with this, oh, we need these icons and there were never any money because this is almost, it's almost pro bono. We got a little money uh, from Project Everyone. But, but so uh, it became weird because in the business model that Trollwick and Company is, I was just a nuisance all the time because they had scheduled their resources. Um, and then I felt also that, that once I started to work with this, I frankly didn't care about commercials anymore. So I, I got more detached from the work that they're doing there. And then, um, you know, I go to Stockholm a lot because that's where I'm from. And it, I just realized that this is going to be a perfect opportunity for me to do something there also and sort of separating them and there's um, a, you know the, the advantage with working in Sweden is that all the big corporations all the big companies in Sweden they understand sustainability they're like so we have um, we have a lot of clients that we can work with and help them communicate sustainability because in, in the end, it's, it's, um, it's a circular system where you have to communicate to people why it's important that, that you're buying sustainable products. And, that's, and if you don't do that, you don't have the demand for, for the companies to do that. So, so you need to create a loop of information here. And that's uh, much easier to do if you have companies that understands it and people that are somewhat educated. Anyone else? Well, thank you. This is somewhat